we are excited. I am excited, but we are excited because depending on how long the Spirit prevails on me this morning, we are closer or further away from eating again. Amen. Uh, some of us have been, at the, as the culmination of this 21 days of prayer, we fasted from, we have fasted completely from food from lunchtime yesterday to lunchtime today. So I can sense, I don't know if it's just the, the spirit, but I can sense you saying, Pastor, make it short, make it sweet. Let us get to, let us get to the blessing. We're in this series, and we do have a mentee, and my AV team is going to help us with that. No quiz this morning, but the, but the slides are on the screen. We're in the middle of this series called House on the Rock, and we've been taking this series in chunks. We had a chunk earlier in the year where we talked about scripture, we talked about prayer, we talked about fasting, and now we are in the second chunk. We started off talking about the importance of community, and last week and this week we're talking about the importance of solitude. That is important to spend time alone with God. And then the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about the Sabbath. Okay, there was just one amen. I don't, I don't know. Maybe people are excited. The next two weeks, we're going to be talking about the Sabbath. Amen. amen. We're going to be talking about the Sabbath. We're really excited about that. But I want to share with you today something a little bit more practical. We talked last week about how Jesus, through his example, often went into the wilderness. And we talked about how that word in the wilderness in the original Greek of the New Testament is the word eremos, and that can be translated as wilderness or desolate place or secluded place or a solitary place. Jesus often went to the wilderness. He often spent time alone in nature with his father. And so we challenged ourselves that we too need to spend time in the wilderness, amen? We too need to spend time in solitude with God. So the question is, how do we do that? That's what we're going to look at. So, the verse that we have for our, our contemplation today, Father, as we open your word, we already prayed, but Lord, I'm praying again, make it clear to us in Jesus' name, amen. Mark 1.35, the verse we're going to kind of take and break apart this morning says this, now, in the morning, when? In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he, that is Jesus, went out and departed to a, what kind of place? Solitary place. And there he prayed. In the morning, having risen a long way before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. If we understand this verse, we have all the information and instruction that we need to know how to be in solitude. So, let's break it down. The first step is go outside. Step one. Mark says that Jesus went out and departed. I, I've been challenged by this these last couple of weeks as I've been preparing for this part of the series. Most of my life as a Christian, I have heard about and I have focused on getting up in the morning and doing my devotions by my bed. Maybe kneeling at my bedside. Maybe uh, I might venture to the living room and, and, and be there in the living room. And listen, there's nothing wrong with praying in your house. In fact, David himself says that he prays and meditates on his bed at night. So there's nothing wrong with that. But the example of Jesus is that he would get up and go out in the morning. There is something apparently that Jesus knew about the benefit of being outside in nature when it comes to connecting with God. So the first step is if we're going to spend time in solitude, my encouragement to you is to find a way to get out. Now, you may be saying, Pastor, but it's okay for some people who live in the suburbs, who have lots of trees around. I live here in the heart of the city. Okay. Can you find a park? Can you find a leafy uh, avenue or street near you with some nice trees 
The point is get outside, experience the fresh air or, or at least the air. Some of us are in Chicago. It's more just air. But experience the air, see some, see some leaves, do something, get out. Here's something that I discovered. There are several scientific benefits to being outside. Scientists study this because uh, they, they want to understand how the world works. So they have discovered that if you spend time outside, you have improved concentration. Improved what? Do you know anyone, maybe that someone is yourself, who struggles with ADHD? We've been hearing a lot about ADHD these, these days, right? We're diagnosing it more and more. There is some debate as to why. But here's the point. Scientists have discovered a 2009 study at the University of Illinois, our own university here in the state, discovered that when people who have ADHD spend just 20 minutes, how many minutes? Just 20 minutes outside, and they give them a task, a puzzle to complete. They give it to them before going outside. They give it to them after going outside. After spending 20 minutes in nature, they are much better able to concentrate. I know a principal, I will not name his name, but who sometimes sends his students to run around, and it helps them concentrate. He's learned the secret. That sometimes getting up and going out can help you concentrate. So I know it's graduation season. I don't know if anyone has any exams coming up. But with all your studying, also go out. Go outside. Another thing that, that science has discovered. It helps overcome trauma and PTSD. This was astounding to me. Maybe you are somebody who's gone through traumatic experiences. Did you know being outside can help with that. There was a study in 2018, the University of California, vet, um, Berkeley, that took uh, army vets and young people who had been raised in traumatic situations, they took them outside, they took them white water rafting. Do you know what that is? Right, that's when you get in the river around this time when it's raining in spring, there's lots of rafting. They took them out there and they discovered that having done that, a week later, their PTSD symptoms dramatically reduced after having spent time on, on the water. And they were trying to understand it. They were trying to, to kind of figure out what was causing that. And they discovered that the people who experienced the most awe, A-W-E, awe, you know that emotion where you just say, wow. Can I translate it into non-scientific speech? The people who discovered the glory of God in nature. And were just like, ah. Oh. It had an impact on their symptoms of PTSD. Friends, you can experience healing from your trauma if you get outside in nature and behold the glory of God in his creation. Another point, another, another thing they found out. It improves blood pressure and heart function. Yes, now, some of you are saying, yeah, of course, Pastor, because when you're outside, you're walking and exercising, and that helps you with blood pressure. No, they did a study. The University of Coventry in the UK did a study. They took some school children. They put them on stationary bicycles inside. But one group, they showed a video of nature as they were riding, and the other group, they showed no video. And the group that just watched nature had lower blood pressure after the 50-minute cycling compared to the group that didn't. So it wasn't just the cycling. It wasn't just the movement. It was movement, even seeing pictures of nature. How much greater if we actually went outside and moved? It can lower blood pressure. It can keep your heart healthy. And last thing. It increases generosity. There are so many more, but these are the only four I could choose. I was astounded by this. Really? Going outside, being in nature makes people more generous? Yes. A university did a study where they put people in a room with beautiful green houseplants. And then they 
tracked them afterwards and they noticed that those who spent time with the plants were more generous than those who didn't. And so I'm calling an emergency board meeting. I'm saying we need to fill the whole sanctuary with plants. We're going to have them hanging from the ceiling. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. There's something about being around a God who gives so freely every flower, every bud, every blade of grass that brings us to a place of generosity and gratitude ourselves. Benefits of being outside. So go outside. The Bible says this. This is Psalms chapter, 100 and, chapter 19, verse 1 and 2. It says this. The heavens declare what? The glory of God and the firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. When we go outside, we enter into, hear me on this, the first book. The what? The first book of God's revelation. Before God gave us the Bible, he gave us creation. And if we had not sinned, now this is going to sound a little bit sacrilegious, we would never have needed a Bible. Because as Paul says in Romans, everything about God can be clearly seen in the things he has made. And what the Spirit is convicting me of is that while I spent years in seminary learning Hebrew and Greek, and thank God for that, and I spent hours in the Bible, I'm not reading the first book. And any of you who like reading or any of you who are authors, where's my sister author? She was, she was waving at me. I see you, sis. I know you're an author. Anybody who writes knows if I'm writing a series and you start the series in book two and you didn't read book one, you're going to miss some things. So we need to be people of the book. Yes, the Bible, but also God's creation. So go out. That's the first step. What's the first step? Go go outside. That's easy. Okay. Second step. How do we how do we do solitude? Okay. Go alone. Yeah, there will be fewer amens in this part of the sermon. <laughs> Pastor, I'm already alone. That's why I come to church because I'm hoping I can be less alone. Maybe I can find somebody else who came to church alone and we can go home and we can be together. I don't know that's why. And now you're telling me I need to be more alone? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not talking about isolating, and, but I'm saying that we need time. Hear this next word undistracted time alone. Many of us do live by ourselves. But we are rarely alone because we are constantly connected, swiping, listening, chatting. And you're like, but I, I don't do social media. Okay, fine. Cable. I don't do cable. Okay. Radio. It has been almost a hundred years since the invention of the radio and the gramophone, which means for almost a hundred years, Human beings have been able to live their lives without having to hear the thoughts of their mind. Because you can just turn something on and it will talk to you. And many of you know, if you're honest, as what happened a few months ago, maybe it was last year, where there was a power outage here in this community. And suddenly all the power went and it was just silent. We all looked at each other like, oh, the spell had been broken. Oh, we live together. Oh, what should we do now? He said, we have no distractions. I guess we have to talk. Hello, I'm your father. Nice to meet you. We rarely experience quiet or silence. We rarely come face to face with our inner selves. Jesus said, go alone. Okay, some of you are saying, okay, but pastor, I am just 12. I can't go alone. 
Otherwise, there's an amber alert. Okay, I get it. I get it. But can we go together outside and then spend time alone for 20 minutes? We go to the same park, the same beach, the same camping ground. But we say, listen, for the next 20 minutes, each person without the phone, without a book, nothing to draw, no knitting, just for 20 minutes, we're going to go off by ourselves and it's going to be just you and God and your thoughts. We need that time. We need that time. In fact, research, scientific research is showing us that there, is, there are benefits to spending time, undistracted time, alone. Uh, one of the first benefits is improved personal exploration. Many people don't spend enough time thinking and reflecting on who they really are. And when we go out and we spend time alone, not talking, not Texting, not watching, not listening, just being. We learn things about ourselves that we couldn't learn anywhere else. And the second thing we discover, it increases creativity. I know this is true for myself. God has been convicting me. Because I like to, when I'm mowing the yard or doing a task, I put my earbuds in and I listen to something. But here's how I do it. I say, but Jesus, I'm listening to sermons. So, like, how are you going to come at me for sermons? But God is, like, revealing to me when I take the earphones out, I find that ideas are coming to my own mind. Things I could do for the church. Things I could do for my family. Things, business ideas. All kinds of things are in my mind. But when I'm constantly listening to something, my mind never gets that opportunity for rumination for problem solving, and so I end up just becoming reflectors of other men's thoughts, men and women's thoughts. So when we get alone and we're undistracted, it increases creativity, but thirdly, it actually gives us more social energy. Can I speak to my introvert friends for a second? The way to have the energy to be in the community that you know you need to be in is by spending intentional time alone. Hear me on this. This is not just crashing in your room and watching your favorite show. Okay, maybe maybe there's, a, there's a role for that. But this is intentionally taking yourself away, even if it's just for 20 minutes, half an hour, with no distractions and letting your mind just wander. It will strengthen and improve your ability to experience social experiences. All right, I use experience twice in a sentence. That was bad grammar. Psalm 62 verse 5 says this, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. If I'm waiting silently, it means there's no distractions. There's no one with me. I'm not talking. I'm waiting by myself for God. So the first thing is to go outside. The second thing is to go The third thing is to go early. Yeah. Yeah, this part's less fun. Go early. Turns out that there are benefits of getting up early. Man, are you reading my notes? Maybe you are. The very first one is improved sleep. This astounded me. Ironically, if you get up early, you will have better sleep. As I shared transparently with you last week, one of the reasons I struggle to get up early is because my argument with God is, but I'll be tired if I get up early. So let me get an extra half an hour sleep now. But apparently God and science, God who made science, science is now figuring it out, have discovered that when you get up early, you get better sleep. Why? Because the early morning sunlight does something special to our bodies, and it aligns our circadian rhythms. Have you heard of this circadian rhythm thing? Google it. It's fascinating. All of us have these internal clocks in our bodies. Can I give you something that's not in the notes? Science is discovering that our internal cell clocks work on a seven-day cycle. I wonder why. I guess the gorillas in the jungle that we evolved from we're doing things on seven, and that's why. That must be, that must be the reason. But anyhow, there are these, there's these internal clocks. 
And when we get out in early morning, what kind of, what kind of time? Early morning sunlight, it sets our clocks correctly so that we start getting sleepy earlier. And therefore, we go to bed early so we can get up early. Scientists have discovered there's one thing that disrupts the circadian rhythms. And that thing is artificial light. Well, I'm, most of this seminar is about me, guys. If this is not for you, if you're delivered, pray, say amen. When the last thing you see at night is the blue light from your screen, it messes up your circadian rhythms. And when your rhythms are off, it messes with your mental health, other aspects of health. So getting up early, ironically, yes, you might be tired for a day or two, but when you get up and go outside, that light hits you, it will reset you, and you'll discover, man, it's 8, oh, 8.30. I was going to stay up for the game, but actually, let me go ahead and go to sleep so I can get up and spend time with Jesus. Amen. Second thing. They've discovered it improves mental health. Again, something about early morning sunlight. I am just astounded at how God made our planet. I don't know how people cannot believe in a creator when everything fits together this way. When the sun gets higher in the sky, the frequency of the sunlight changes, and you don't get the same kind of benefits as when it's low in the sky in the morning. And that early morning light also stimulates us to produce serotonin. Turn to your neighbor and say serotonin. Ser not serotonin. It's not, it's not a woman called Sarah. Who's last serotonin. One word. It is a brain chemical. If you've never heard of this, serotonin is the thing that makes you feel happy. It's what puts you in a good mood. When you first meet someone, Special, your body starts pumping you with serotonin and you start connecting. Hmm, when I'm around them, I feel happy. I don't know why. I should spend more time with them, right? When you run, we have a runner here. You had a runner's high. You get to the end of that run and you just feel a buzz. That's serotonin. You also get serotonin when you are hit with the rays of the sun early in the day. And so studies have shown that people who get early morning light have less depression. Why? Because serotonin helps you overcome depression. Why do we live in a world where people are more and more depressed? Is it that it's more stressful? Sure. Is it the chemicals in the food? Possibly. But my guess is that this thing, which keeps us all up late at night, and therefore, we miss out on the early morning light. We don't get our serotonin hit. God designed you to be a morning bird. Yes. Next thing. Improved nutrition. Now, my young people are saying cap at this point. Like, how does waking up early improved nutrition. That doesn't even, that's not even connected. I just graduated from high school. Even I know that's not connected. Well, let me, let me explain. The earlier you get up, the earlier you are hungry. If you get up early and you are hungry early, you are much more likely to make a healthy breakfast choice. But if you get up right before you have to leave and then you figure out you're hungry some way on the way to work or school, you're going to discover that apparently, according to Justin Fields, who is no longer here, Chicago runs on Duncan. And so you may say, well, if it's good enough for Justin, it's good enough for me. And so you may stop in and get you a decaffeinated <coughs> coffee with your fully sugared donut, which is the sugar worse than the caffeine. We'll talk about that another time. But either way, you start your day that way. But if you woke up early, you might discover you woke up, woke up at 4.35. By 6.30, you're hungry. And guess what's not in your kitchen? 
freshly made donuts, unless you really got it like that, in which case, wow, let's talk later, how are you making donuts at 6 a.m. in the morning? Probably you're going to look around and see your oatmeal or, your, or a banana or an apple, and you're going to eat that, and it's going to give you energy for the day and better nutrition. So studies show people who get up earlier have lower blood sugar levels. Get up early. The Bible says, in case science is not our thing, the Bible says, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. The psalmist says, I get up early. In case you want something to do this afternoon, those of you who are Bible geeks, go to your concordance or go to your software and search early. I was shocked by how many of God's people consistently got up early, from Moses to Jacob to Abraham to Gideon. It's just a consistent pattern in Scripture. God's people get up early. So, how do we spend time in solitude? The first thing, go. Go outside. Second thing, go alone. Okay, now, now again, I'm not saying you have to be alone the whole time. You could go with someone, but have some alone time. That's the point. Third thing, go early. So now I'm outside. It's early. I'm by myself. Now what do I do? Worry about all the things I have to do today. Worry about the kids and the neighbor and the boss and the work and the president or the soon-to-be president. Because that's what my mind naturally does, right? That's part of why I don't like to be alone. That's part of why I resist solit solit solitude. Because when I just turn everything off, my brain's like... I think crazy thoughts. I get random, like, what happens if one day, you know, one of my kids is not breathing? Like, just, just random things come into my head. Like, just, and most of us, we don't like that, so we resist it. But here's what I've discovered. If you do this consistently, that spinning wheel of your mind will eventually run itself out. And then it, then it will settle down into a different rhythm. So, yeah, so you may have to go through that point. But keep going. But what do you do when you're out there? The answer is that Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. And as I was reflecting on this, it challenged me. Because, yes, we've just come through 21 days of prayer. But can I be honest with you? Prayer is my weakest suit. I'm not good at praying. I really am not. You know, I, I see my, my dear elder Amy June is here. Like, man, when I grow up, I want to pray like you. Like, when she prays, it's like God is right next to her. You can hear it in her voice, Right? I, and I'm inspired by so many, so many of, the, of you beautiful prayers this, this week. Sister Nancy, where are you, Sister Nancy Uchama? Where is she? She's, I see her. She's somewhere here. Powerful woman of God praying. Just beautiful, so many beautiful prayers. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm just, I just don't really have that. But as I was thinking about it, I was thinking when Jesus was by himself on the mountain, did he spend the whole time just on his knees with his hands folded and just praying just through his laundry list? And Lord, I pray for my mother and my grandmother. Was that just, was that all it was? And I realized that prayer is more, it's what? Not less. It's more than simply telling God the things we need. We should definitely do that. Don't misunderstand me. But prayer is more than just going through our list of requests. Prayer is actually communion, communicating with God. And God is spirit. Okay, stay with me. Does God need you to verbalize your prayers for him to communicate with you. So in other words, you can hold communion with God in your mind. Can I, can I help you even more? God 
the Bible says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means if you have accepted Jesus as Lord, and if you have not, you would not be here. You would not be listening. If you have a heart of faith towards God, the Spirit of the living God lives in you, which means God is already a part of everything that's in your mind anyway. Now, I know why there are fewer amens on that part, because you're like, well, wait a minute. You mean when I had that thought that I later repented of, he was there while I had the thought? Can I bring David to help you? David says, before a word is on my tongue, you know it. Not only was he there when you had the thought, he was like, he's about to have that thought. Oh, yeah. I see the traffic's backing up. He's about to show some hand signs that are not from Scripture. I, I listen. I know where this is going. God is always with us. Here's the issue. We are not always intentionally aware of the presence of God. We are not always intentionally holding communion with God. Have you ever, and, and forgive me if this is not a, a, a PC term in America, but have, have you ever received one of those butt calls? Is that, is that how they say it in America? You know, when someone has the phone in their pocket and they accidentally call you? Have you, have you ever, butt dial, okay. Have you ever had that? And then you pick it up. I don't know if you have a phone voice, but I have a phone voice, you know, so I'm like, oh, hello. Like, you know, you had that strange... So you're like, hello, who's that? Hello. And all you're hearing is, and the, like the occasional word, like, uh, hun, hun, get the hun. And then you realize, oh, they don't know they're calling me. And what you do next, I think, divides humans into two groups. There's the group like me who is terrified of hearing something I shouldn't hear from my dear friend and church sister or brother. So I hang it up, hang it up, hang it up. And then there are the rest of you reprobates who listen. Like, oh. Okay, and, and God bless you, God bless you. There, there, is, there is grace in Jesus. But here's the point, here's the point. Some of us are experiencing that kind of relationship with God. The phone's on. He's listening, he's dialed in, he's connected, but we're just going around as though he doesn't hear. We're just unconscious of him. But if only we would be conscious, we'd realize we can be, as Paul says, praying without ceasing. Because every thought of our mind, we can think and experience in the presence of a holy God. So prayer is more. We should definitely make our requests, but it's more than that. Here's an, here's an example from Scripture. Exodus 33, 11. This is where God wants to get with each one of us. It says, so the Lord spoke to Moses, how? Face to face, as a man speaks to... Help us on this part, Lord. Please, please don't mishear this. I'm not coming against anyone. But what kind of a friendship would you have with someone if every time they spoke to you, they said, Dear Eliash, my amazing and well bearded friend, I am speaking to you right now because I must request that you give me more AV power. I thank you for the AV power you have already given me. But here, my dear friend Eliash, though he who is great with uh, AV, would you please give me even more of your AV power? And I thank you for this. I know I have it. Okay, goodbye. If that was the sum total of your conversations, would you have a much of a friendship? Now again, friends, don't, don't, don't miss it. I'm not saying we should, I love those prayers. But my point is, when the Bible says God spoke to Moses like a man speaks to his friend, was Moses the whole time just saying, I know, Lord of the mountain? Or was he sometimes saying, man, these, this is a long line for the people coming to the tent today. Oh, strengthen me, Lord. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta listen to, oh. oh it's Sister Rebecca again. She's gonna come here to complain about the goats. <sighs> and did God ever say, oh no, goats, right? Maybe she should have a scapegoat. I mean, did, did they ever joke together? Like, if God's point is that we would have the same relationship with him that we have with a friend, is there space in my prayer life to talk to God about my everyday experiences? Can I tell him when I'm annoyed because the server is taking long? 
And can he says, listen, I, I feel your pain because you took long to respond to my grace. But listen, you know, can I tell God about my pain, about my disappointment? Can I go with God to watch the Cubs? Does Jesus watch baseball? He, he knows all things, friends. So <laughs> I don't know if he watches it or he just instantly knows. My point is God wants to, us to bring him into every aspect of his life. Now, what, I know what you're thinking, but pastor, there are some aspects of my life that God should not be in. And that's the point. If I bring him into every aspect of my life, it may change some of the aspects of my life. I may not be able to finish that series because Jesus is sensitive. And he doesn't like that show. God had a relationship with Moses where he spoke to him as a person would speak to their friend. And then he, Moses, would return to the camp. Having spent this kind of time with God, speaking to him like friend to friend, sharing his heart, sharing his joys, sharing his fears. This, friends, is what prayer in the secret place, pray, praying in the wilderness can be like. This is what Jesus had with his father. Here's another few verses of scripture. We don't have time to go into this much, but here's a concept we may come back to later. David says, I will also meditate. I will what? On all your works and talk of your deeds. In another psalm, he says, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. Now, we don't have time to unpack this, but in Scripture, there is such a thing as meditation. So for any of you for whom that word makes you uncomfortable, I'm sorry, but it's in the Bible. But when we read the Bible, the word meditate is never something that is connected to nothing. It is not, some, it's not just a state of emptiness in the Bible. It is something that I do on something else. I meditate on your works. I meditate on your precepts. I meditate on your law. And this word really means to contemplate well, here's a good word. It means to ruminate. To ruminate. Do you know what that word means? Rumination. See, this is, this is why we need to go outside. Because much of the illustrations from Scripture are taken from outside. When a cow or a cattle-type animal eats uh, grass, you know what happens, right? It chews it, it swallows it down, and then it, it has four stomachs. And it digests it a little bit. Then it brings it back up. Forgive me if this part is, is, is distasteful. But friends, that's how you get milk. So if you like milk, you're going to love the process. So it brings it back up. And it chews it again. And it goes back down to the second stomach. Digests it a bit more. Brings it back up. That's called rumination. Sheep do the same thing. Friends. We can ruminate on the word of God. Some of you are saying, Pastor, I read the Bible, I didn't get it. I get it. Did you ruminate? No, I wanted to get it in one second, like and it was instant from the microwave. That's not how the Bible works. The Bible is designed for you to read something, go outside early, alone, and walk around and watch your mind start to ruminate. And God will make connections through what you're seeing and what you've read and your experience. This is what it means to meditate. So meditation is also a part of prayer. My point is, prayer is not only just talking to God, it's also thinking about God's word. That also counts as prayer. And when I realized that, I said, okay, maybe I'm half decent at prayer because I do that. I do that. I do it much better when I go outside. I spend time with God. Okay, we're done. Last quote and then we're done. Ministry of Healing, page 52, says this. The early morning, the when? She's talking about Jesus. The early morning often found him in some secluded place meditating. We know what that means now, right? Searching the scripture. By the way, pause here. In the time of Jesus, were Bibles like this shape and size and so easy to carry? What did they look like? 
big scrolls. If you've ever been to a Jewish worship service or seen it on TV, it's a big scroll. So was Jesus going into the wilderness with a big old scroll of Isaiah and, a, and on the other arm, Genesis? So how was he searching the scripture? Thy word have I hidden where? In my heart. Can I give a quick plug for AY where we're going to be talking about how to memorize scripture? Okay. So he was searching the scriptures he had already memorized. And so he would meditate, search the scripture, and pray. And then I love this part. With the voice of singing, he did what? Welcomed the morning light. He did this often. He would often get up, often go out, often alone to a secluded place. And he would pray. What does that mean? He would talk to his father. He would, he would think of scripture, meditate on scripture. And he would sing to welcome the Okay, some of you are still not there. So your Savior Jesus, help me Lord right here, in the morning, facing the rising sun, singing songs to welcome the morning sun. That's what he often did. Many of us, if we heard that the conference president was caught at the lake early in the morning, and we didn't know, but all we saw is that he was there with his hands raised and he was singing, to, we'd say, our oh, oh, paganism, listen, the Masons have got in the church. Because we have become so afraid of the very things God made for us. There is nothing wrong with being outside and greeting the sun with songs. Not because we're singing to the sun, but we're singing to the son of God who made the sun. Who made heaven and earth. The heavens declare the glory of God. Even the birds. This was how he spent time with God. And friends, I want to invite you to try it. Go outside. Go alone. Go early. Pray. Meditate. And yes, sing. Now, some of you are saying, I'll really have to be secluded. I mean, it'd have to be no one for miles before I open my voice. Okay, well, get secluded. And sing to your Father. And praise Him for His creation. And experience the blessing. Experience the blessing. Why? So that's what Jesus did. But why did he often get up before dawn? Yes, I'm sure he knew all the things about the, the early light. I mean, he made that. He knew about nature and, and PTSD. He made all of that. But, but why did he go? He knew it was important to, 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 to spend time with God. He knew all of that. But why was he so often going before the dawn? Pun intended, it dawned on me this week. He wanted to experience sunrise. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you intentionally went somewhere to experience the sunrise? I had to think, man, it's been a, this might be a few years. I mean, I've occasionally gone early and, and the sunrise caught me. But when was the last time I went out with the purpose of getting to a spot? I mean, here in the city, we probably have to go to the lake to get a clear view. And being there while it was still dark. Now you get it. He got up a long time before light. Why? Because he wanted time to hike there and get there so that he had a front row seat to see the sunrise. And as Sister White said, he would often sing these songs. And welcome the rising of the morning. Why did he do that? Friends, I got it and it's so good, I can't wait to tell you. The heavens declare what? The glory of God. Every day, thank you Lord, the heavens enact the gospel. Mm. The sun dies, as it were. It sets and it seems as though darkness has won. It gets cold. 
the birds cease singing. The plants and the flowers can't grow. It seems as though night will prevail. But every morning, because of the great faithfulness of God, the sun gets up and the darkness cannot hold it down. And so the Son of God regularly had to remind himself, thank you, Jesus, that even though he was struggling in this human flesh, and even though he knew one day they'd nail him to a cross and they'd put him in the grave, but he knew that just as the sun rises every day, so he would rise. And he would rise with all healing and power in his rays. And every morning he could, he worshipped his father for the truth that's embedded in the sunrise, but I miss it most days. I miss the gospel. But thank God for the birds. You know how I know the birds have more faith than me? The birds don't sing at sunrise. They start singing before. Oh, I love this part. They are so certain that even while it's dark, they say, we're about to start singing. Because the sun is faithful and the sun will rise. Friends, some of us need to start singing in the middle of the darkness of our situation. The darkness of our diagnosis. The darkness of our relationships. The darkness of our finances. The darkness of this broken world. Because the sun of God will rise. And there is nothing the devil can do to stop it. That must make him so mad. No wonder he tried to get the nations to think he was the sun. Because every day, after his plans at night, God's like, yeah, no, you're not, no, I'm still going to win. Still going to rise. Still going to rise. So, go outside. Go alone. Go, uh, what was the other one? I, even I forgot that. The, the gospel got too good for me. Go early and pray. And see the gospel enacted and start your day knowing you have already won because Jesus is alive. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, we need to spend time with you outside in solitude. Lord, you've shown us a few practical steps, but empower us now to actually do what we have heard so we would not simply be hearers of the word but do us as well. We pray in the name of the risen Son of God, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to the end of this time with you, through your word, your light has shone on us. We are grateful. But Lord, teach us how to let your light shine on us outside. It will help our health, physical, emotional health. But Lord, like our Savior Jesus, we may discover that the gospel is in every leaf and bud and star and cloud and tree, that if we learn, we would realize that we are never alone because we are literally surrounded by messages of your victory everywhere we go. May we learn how to experience that in solitude. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.